ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome. And thank you for being here for uh, at our monthly series, A Librarian's World. This is a monthly session where our librarians share their experience, insights and thoughts on their area of expertise. And this evening, we get to hear from our colleagues, Fiona Tan from the National Archives of Singapore. A warm welcome. And Gracie Lee from the National Library. Let's welcome her as well. They will showcase the key historical sources on the Japanese occupation found in the National Libraries and Archives collection. Let me share a bit about uh, our colleagues today. Fiona Tan is an assistant archivist at the National Archives, where she conducts research to promote interest in the archives' rich documentary collections. She's also involved in the curatorial work to revamp the exhibition at the former Ford Factory. Gracie Lee is a senior librarian with the National Library, where she works primarily with its rare collection. In a most recent article in the library's quarterly journal, Bibli Asia, she delved into a 1946 book from the Raffles Library collection that featured wartime churches in Singapore under the Japanese occupation. She has previously involved in the development of the library's ephemera collection and newspaper SG, the library's online newspaper archive. So please welcome both of them. Hi, uh, good evening to everybody. Uh, thank you for taking the time to come down this evening uh, to hear us share about the resources, historical resources in the National Library and National Archives collection. Uh, firstly, uh, just a brief outline on the uh, areas that I'll be covering before I'll, I'll be taking the first half an hour and then Fiona will take the next half an hour. So first, uh, I will be touching on the history of collecting on the Japanese occupation in the National Library, uh, followed by a look at some of the Japanese sources in our collection and then to the British Commonwealth. I use the word British Commonwealth because uh, uh, the Australian forces also fought here, so we use a general term. And then what I call local sources. Uh, local sources meaning those which were published or produced here uh, in Singapore or Malaya. And um, as the number of materials uh, on this subject is really uh, a lot and very wide, um, the scope of uh, the presentation uh, uh, surrounds only the materials published in and around the period of the Japanese occupation. So uh, we'll not I will not be going into the contemporary titles. Okay, uh, firstly, uh, collecting on the Japanese occupation. Uh, actually, the collection started very early, right uh, in the period of the Japanese occupation in February 1942. So uh, at that time, the Raffles Library, then at uh, Stamford Road, uh, it was uh, renamed as the Shonan Toshokan. And uh, some British... Uh, uh, colonial staff were actually retained. Not all of them went into internment. Some of them were actually retained by the Japanese and they worked alongside local staff and with the Japanese staff uh, to manage the library and the museum. So uh, this is the period where uh, we started collecting on the propaganda newspapers that were published in Singapore and Malaya. I think some of the familiar titles you would hear would be the Shonan Shimbun as well as the Zhao Nan Repao. So these were actually primarily collected by one single person, which was actually uh, E.J.H. Corner, which uh, most of may be familiar to some of you. He was the assistant director of the Botanic Gardens. And um, at personal risk, he actually started collecting these newspapers and he stored them in the archives room. And when it got a bit like too obvious, he brought them to the Botanic Gardens and he kept them in the specimens cabinet. After that, after the war, then he brought them out. So he actually chronicled his experiences of working in the library and collecting these in a book called The Marquis, A Tale of uh, Shonanto, which we have a copy on the table if you want to read after uh, the talk. So um, in this period, not uh, most of the materials that were collected really was on the newspapers. Uh, at least for myself, I haven't come across any material, other type of materials uh, that were collected during this period. And uh, Connor himself said that after the, uh, when the Japanese surrendered, they actually burned a lot of the materials, including uh, the Straits Times archive of the Shonan Shimbun. Yeah, so to be able to have this 
uh, a very uh, complete, almost complete collection of these newspapers is very valuable for us today. And then after that, um, after 45, um, the materials that come into our collection came from legal deposit. There was a flourishing of memoirs. A lot of people wrote about their uh, experiences during the war. Uh, this can be both fic uh, non-fiction, meaning these are factual accounts, or they could be fictional treatment, meaning novels or fiction works, which were inspired by real experiences of the war. And then uh, acquisition, especially lately, we have been acquiring materials. And then, but I have to say the bulk of it, after looking through the collection, the bulk of our collection really comes from our donors, which we are very, very thankful for. And of course, um, the latest collection that came into the library was late last year, Mr. Lim Xiaobin uh, donated his... Uh, maps and books. So now we will just go straight into the core, the content. Okay, these are, first we'll touch on Japanese maps and atlases. We have about maybe over 100. Uh, everything that I give you is really approximate because we don't really go in and list and count everything. So this is a general sense. And the period, uh, most of it fall within 1939 to 1944. And most of them actually comes from Mr. Lim Xiaobin's collection. And there are quite a number that actually show the Greater East Asia co-prosperity, co it's quite a mouthful, <laughs> prosperity sphere, which is actually the Japanese, uh, the name which the Japanese gave to their wartime empire. So it covers um, North Asia, Southeast Asia, as, uh, as well as uh, areas in the Pacific Ocean. And probably one of the earliest on this subject will be this, uh, Heio Ipanzu which is a military map on the Dutch East Indies, published by the Imperial Japanese Navy in 1914. So I um, brought this out because it kind of shows Japanese military interest in Southeast Asia even before the invasion of Manchuria in 1931. Okay, now we go into this map. It's actually a mineral resources map of uh, Nanyang or the South Sea, Southeast Asia. This was actually printed in Tokyo on 22nd December 1941 and then distributed in 25th December 1941. And what it shows on the map is the position of resources, mineral resources like bauxite, sulfur, uh, carbon, uh, tin, gold, uh, all, these air, all these mineral resources. And uh, if you can see here, uh, these four graphs here, uh, they actually show the production levels of the various resources in Southeast Asia. For example, tin, oil, manganese, iron, and so on and so forth. And I've actually blown up this area. This is actually Malaya. So you can see um, the triangle, triangle here uh, actually refers to iron. And the diamond shape refers to uh, uh, tin, and the cross with the circle is actually gold. So I brought this up to kind of show like uh, the reason for Japan's military interest in Southeast Asia because it was really all about gaining control over the natural resources uh, to fuel uh, their, wartime, uh, their war efforts as well as uh, their economy back home. But it's also a twofold thing because it's not only for themselves, but it's also to cripple the economy of their enemies. So maybe I'll just quote from uh, Tsuji Masunobu. Sorry, I have problems pronouncing Japanese names. Uh, he actually said, if shortage of oil and steel is, is Japan's weak point, the greatest weakness in America's economy, shortage of rubber, tin, and tungsten. So uh, their idea is once they grab all the resources here, not only can they fuel their own, own economy, they can also prevent uh, the supply of these uh, resources uh, to Western colonial powers like America. Okay, now we have another map. This is a very interesting one. Uh, we translated this latest world map of the Greater East Asia Warfare. And this was actually published on 10th February 1942. So at this time, uh, the invasion of Singapore had already begun, but the British has not yet surrendered. The surrender date is actually 15 February 1942. So we see this map here. Okay, maybe I'll just... Uh, there are three insert maps of Europe. This is actually the time zone, and here is of Southeast Asia. So I've blown up this area. You can see that even so, this map was printed on 10th 
uh, February, Singapore was already given the name Zhao Nan Tao or Shou Nan Tou. Yeah. Uh, then the, the map was actually distributed on the 15. Now we'll go uh, a bit more into two other maps, and uh, they're quite interesting in how they show that uh, different aspects. This is actually a map prepared by the Japanese 25th Army. Uh, it's, it's dated February 1942. So there isn't an actual date given, just says February 192. And we believe this to be a planning map. Uh, it details the intended course of evasion into Singapore. So over here, you can see this blue text here. It's actually some battle command saying that the attack will come from the northeast and they'll capture Salita down to the reservoir, down Racecourse Road, then towards the city. Okay, and the instructions also noted that they think the British will be focusing their defense on the east of Salita. So they have also planned, they didn't say northwest, but they said, oh. um, they have also planned an attack from the west. Okay, so the lines in red, we believe it to be the British, and the blue lines actually refer to the Japanese. And along the blue lines, you will actually see dates. Uh, can't quite see here, but if you blow up the map, you can actually see dates. So uh, possibly indicating that these might be the possible dates of attack. Now we look at this map, you can see it looks a bit different. Um, the blue lines are now coming from the northwest, and you just have one blue line coming on the northeast towards Pulau. Uh, Ubin, and then straight towards the city. Because this actually shows the actual cause of attack, not the plan, not the planned one. So this was also published in February 1942 with no actual dates by the Ministry of War in Japan. Uh, and it illustrates the Japanese Imperial Army's progress into Singapore. It marks out all the important military targets, the supplies and infrastructure, as well as the dates and direction in which they had successful breakthrough. Why do I kind of think after looking with my colleagues that this is an actual attack, like an actual record of attack? Because with these blue lines, there are actually dates, and dates correspond closely to the events that took place right down to the exact time. So if you see this blue line here, it says 9 December, 10.45 p.m. It's very, very exact. And then it ends, the map actually ends, the last date on the map is 11 uh, 11 February, uh, which is the date where the Japanese offered uh, offered a surrender. Uh, su uh, what do you call? Suggested that the British should should surrender. So um, 11 February is actually a very significant date because it actually falls on uh, Kigan Sutsu. Sorry, it's actually a national holiday where the Japanese celebrate uh, the emperor. Sort of like it focuses on the empress, it, what they call uh, Empire Day. So that was a very significant date because uh, the Japanese had actually conquered the difficult area, which is Bukit Tima. And with that confidence, they actually offered the surrender, hoping that maybe the next day uh, the British would actually surrender on the 12th. But of course, they held on. Uh, there was actually another battle fought here, which is the Battle of Pasir Panjang, or some people say Opium Hill. Uh, but I don't see that reflected here because the map ends on the 11th. Okay, here we have another. All those maps I mentioned just now all come, come from Mr. Lim Xiaobin's collection. And here I'm showing a book. It's not really a map. Uh, it's called The Record of Sanitary Details of Military Importance. This comes from the Tosho Igawa collection. And Mr. T uh, Tosho Igawa, his collection deals a lot with uh, military warfare, uh, Japanese military warfare. Yeah, so this book was actually published by the Ministry of War in Japan in September 1941. And there were three volumes, but this particular volume here, number three, is our Malaya. And this book actually gives an overview of Malaya, like the population, um, transportation, climate. But more importantly, it talked about um, medical facilities, the kind of tropical diseases that you will encounter when you are in this part of the world and where are the suitable places where you can camp, and where are the food and water supplies. So we think this was probably function as a handbook that was given out to Japanese soldiers to prepare them for the invasion of Malaya. And this map here is actually a map showing all the uh, medical facilities. 
Okay, now we go on to uh, pictorial works. We have quite a number also. Uh, basically, they serve as a visual record of the Japanese military campaign, their successes, to celebrate their successes, and also how they administered their conquered territories. And a number of these were published as commemoratives. So these pictures here, they're all taken from these books. Here you can see them cycling down Malaya. And here's the battle at Bukit Timah. And then, of course, after the fall of Singapore, this is like a victory parade down Raffles Square. Okay, so a lot of words on the text. Uh, this is just for those who are interested to look at these resources. I just thought it would be helpful to name some of the materials. And uh, what you find that these pictorial works, they are illustrated either as uh, images of black and white photographs, or they could be colored images of paintings. And these were produced by war correspondences or photographers or uh, war artists which accompanied these troops as they uh, made their southward advance through Malaya. So I thought that was quite interesting. I mean, the British had their own, but the Japanese also had their own uh, people who recorded visually what was happening on the ground. So uh, you'll see most of them are like from Asashi, Shimbun, or they were war correspondents attached to the Air Force. And... Uh, some of them were the press unit of the Japanese army and others were from like this one, uh, Japan Photo Almanac uh, is by the Domain News Agency which was the official news agency of the Empire of Japan and then the last one is actually a collection of uh, colored paintings by Japanese war artists and it was published by the Japanese Maritime Society of Arts Okay, now we just go like uh, deeper to see uh, two. One is this uh, photographic report of the Greater East Asia War. This was published as a commemorative for the first anniversary. And these are actual um, photographs slotted into books. So there are like 40 of these photographs showing the major battles. And of course, here we have the picture of the British Surrender Party walking up towards Fort Factory with uh, Sugita Iji, which is the intelligence officer of the 25th Army. So now we have another book from, also pictorial work, of the same incident, but you can see it's a bit different. This time, this is by a war artist. So artist being an artist impression uh, is not factually accurate. Because here we see the surrender party. Here we see the Japanese. Uh, Sugita here, and Yamashita here. Uh, yeah, it doesn't quite look like him. Uh, the, he's quite skinny, and then he has all the symbols. He has a binoculars, carrying a map. Here is his samurai sword, and can't quite see here, but this is actually a cannon facing the British. And of course, Singapore in plumes of smoke. And you can see, compared to this small party here, you have so many troops from the Japanese side, and their flag is high, and here the flag is drooping. So it's full of a uh, symbolic meaning, but uh, may not be factually correct. And this painting was actually titled The Last Day of the Union Jack. And it accompanies a chapter on conquering Singapore. So this book here, um, it has both textual description as well as such paintings or photographs on each of the major battles uh, from 1941, the uh, attack on Pearl Harbor, right up to the Third Battle of the Solomon Sea in November 1941. Okay, next, uh, another way for us to find out, besides maps and pictorial, um, to find out, you know, what was it like at that time. Uh, these are personal narratives, but these are narratives coming from the Japanese perspective. So, the first is a book on the Imperial Japanese Army attacking Singapore, second on Bukitima, and the third, uh, I think, oops, would be a bit more accessible to most people because Singapore assignment was actually written in English and published in English. Uh, I find this book quite a fascinating read. It's by someone called Tatsuki Fuji. He was actually an uh, American-educated Japanese journalist. So he came to Singapore in 1939, before the invasion took place. And he was actually the editor of the Singapore Herald, which we have in our collection, if uh, you are interested to look at pre-wartime Japanese newspapers. Um, then, when the Pacific War broke out, he was actually an uh, intern in Changi Jail and actually sent off to India in the intern camp, internment in detention camp. Then he came back to Singapore and became the editor of the Shonan Times. 
so his uh, memoir actually ends at the part where he uh, assumed editorship of the Shunan Times. So I find this quite an interesting read. And then the next is a landing ahead of the enemy at Kotabaru. This is by uh, a brigade commander in the 18th uh, Division. And I think this book is quite familiar to most people. Shona My Times, which is by Shonazaki uh, Mamuru, which was the officer at the Shona municipality. And then I just named others, which uh, you might find interesting. Uh, FK Khan, which was the intelligence unit which organized the Indian National Army. And then the second one, History of Shonan Special Municipality, is about the collected memoirs of those who worked with the um, Municipal Council. Okay. Mm. Okay, uh, but maybe I'll just spend more time in this work, which is, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, an often studied work. Here we are on the first, this is the first edition in Japanese, uh, and then translated into English. And then this is the most current uh, reprint of it. So the author is actually uh, Suji uh, Masanobu. He was the director and operations of the planning staff under General Yamashita. And he was one of the key strategists for the Japanese invasion of Malaya. So his memoir actually offers a lot of valuable insights on the Malayan campaign from the Japanese point of view. So it gives us information like how they started planning and how they actually trained in uh, Taiwan, uh, Formosa, you know, because the conditions were very similar to Malaya, the, the kind of tropical conditions. So, and then, of course, he talks all the way up to the uh, Battle of Singapore. Okay, and um, in case you're wondering the title, he actually took the title, The Hinge of Fate, from Churchill's own words about the turning point of the Second World War. Yeah. And uh, what I find interesting is that the English edition, the first English edition, uh, has a introduction uh, written by Gordon Bennett, who was the commander of the 8th Australian Division in the Battle of Singapore. Uh, later on, we'll see and talk more about him. He's uh, quite a controversial figure. Okay, then next we have magazines. They're mainly produced for propaganda purposes for the readers at home because they need to show up support at home or to the newly conquered territories. So some were specifically published for wartime purposes, but others were just regular magazines, and then they had special editions on the war. So uh, here we have the Asashi Graph, and then this Taiyang, and then uh, Daito Kenzutsi Gaho, and then this is the uh, Da Dongya Gong Lun, in my Chinese. <laughs> Okay, so Asashi Graph, we know, is a regular magazine, but this is a special is issue on, the, on Singapore and shows Yamashita here. And then, uh, okay, Taiyang. Taiyang is in, published in Tokyo uh, by Asashi Shimbun, but it's in Chinese and English. So it's obviously, to me, la, not meant to be read by Japanese audience. It's meant to be read by people uh, in their newly conquered territories. And Daito Kengatsu Gaho, uh, was published by the Japanese Intelligence Bureau in Tokyo, and it appeared in many editions. So the English edition, the title here was say Fran. Then he had Spanish, and then they had Chinese. And then this Da Tong Ya, Gong Lun, is actually Chinese, and it was uh, published in Tokyo as well. So these magazines actually record their war victories, and it shows uh, Japan as a very modern society, and uh, how they actually administered their conquered territories, and how they were making progress in these areas. And of course, the usual concepts like the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. And then here, I just do a more detailed one. You can see the covers. This is actually the sinking of the Repulse and the Prince of Wales. This is Home Life. Okay, the title is in English. It was published by the Osaka Mainichi Shimbun and the Tokyo Nichi Nichi Shimbun Sha. So it was distributed in Manchuria, China, Indochina, and Thailand. So you'll see most of the text is actually written in English, but there's some text in French or Chinese. And uh, this is the March issue here. Of course, uh, since they conquered Singapore in Feb, so the March issue will be on Singapore. And this issue has many, many things like the sinking of the repulse and stuff. And here you see Singapore full surrenders 
And then you can see the English text, it says Singapore, the greatest British stronghold in East Asia, fell at last on February 15. In this photograph, Nippon troops, after advancing as far as Johor Bahru, are seen awaiting the signal for general attack against Singapore Island uh, that can be seen in the distance across the Straits of Johor. And this is another page where they actually give a, a timeline milestone in English of uh, their attack from December all the way to the surrender. And then here they actually put their war results. Yeah, so I believe this is them in Bukit Timah. Uh, okay, not too sure, I haven't looked at that. Okay, and this one um, is quite an interesting journal in our collection called uh, Kane's Zoo or Flame Tree. This actually w was a military, uh, literary magazine that was published in Singapore um, even before, like from around 1944. So you see NUS Library has a copy of it. But it was purely literary, so meaning that the Japanese in Singapore were publishing this literary journal uh, for literary expression. So they wrote short stories or, or they had uh, uh, literature, poetry and stuff like that. But these copies that we have here actually were published, you can see, after the Japanese surrender. So these issues were actually uh, produced by the surrendered Japanese personnel who were detained in these uh, uh, detention camps uh, run by the British. So because they couldn't go back at first, right, the British troops had to be repatriated first. So they ha retained these Japanese troops back in Singapore to help with the reconstruction of Singapore. So just like the, what I find fascinating is that the POWs, the British POWs, obviously created their own newsletters and all when they were interned and they created art and stuff like that. But same thing also the Japanese, when they surrendered, they also created their own. So this is from the Woodlands and the River Valley Work Corps uh, Welfare Department. So these were the two camps and they produced these uh, literary magazines for recreation. So what you'll find interesting, I mean, they have the usual stuff like the literary stuff, uh, but they also had uh, comments, entries about the account of what was life like in the Woodlands camp and also news about the repatriation of the surrendered personnel because the British had actually given a deadline for them to be repatriated by the end of 1947 and how the rest which didn't get to go home will be sent to the Jurong camp. And if you look at the physical book, physical magazine, I've find quite interesting. This is like the cover and it's all hand painted but the hand drawn actually and then the pages behind are mimeograph sheets so those can be done like in mass production but these have to be individually drawn and you can see this word here woodlands and what's interesting is behind the cover what they use was the, the back end of the maps, disused maps so when I turn to the map, I try to figure out which country did they use and you'll see things like Pacific Islands and stuff like that. So each cover or each issue is literally unique because they were just using whatever resources they had with them and they made these. Okay, now I go into uh, propaganda. So in our collection, uh, we don't have a lot, but we have some to show that propaganda wasn't only for the adults, it was aimed towards children also. Ooh. Here we have this. Singapore surrenders, and you see uh, to, uh, Tojo Hide, uh, Hideki, who's the Prime Minister of Japan, and he was also the Army Minister or War Minister at that time. So this was produced to celebrate the first anniversary of the fall of Singapore. This I can see the header here, Singapore surrenders. And inside, there's actually a two-cent stamp uh, that was published, that was printed to commemorate. And then inside, you have these little photos. Uh, I find this book interesting because you can't see from here, but it's actually a miniature book. If I were to hold up and put it in my palm, it's actually smaller than the palm of my hand. It's very, very, very tiny. And here we have a map to teach Japanese children about the military gains in their new territories. Uh. And here I blow up Malaya. You can see these are rubber tappers. So I guess they gain all the rubber. 
You also gain this green tiger here. <laughs> okay, just a joke. Uh, I mean, you can see it's obviously meant for children. They did all this like uh, uh, cartoon type of illustration. When you see Australia, you can actually see like kangaroos on it. Yeah, so these were aimed towards uh, children. And here, I'm sorry, I do apologize. Some of these are my bad photography taking skills. This map, if it looks a bit strange because it's not actually a map, it's actually a dice game. So it works something like snakes and ladders. So here you have like Japan. And then you start from Japan and you play the game. You get to Manchuria and then you get to China. And these faces here are people who are allies, who have allied themselves with the Japanese uh, for nationalist reasons. Huh? Like uh, Chandra Bose because of the Indian independence movement. So here is Wang Jingwei from China. And after this, he goes to uh, Burma. Okay, then you can go to India. Then you come here to Singapore. Here is actually the port of Singapore, and here is actually the Shonan Jinja. Okay, after that, you can go to here. I think this is uh, Thailand, and this is Java, and then this is Indochina, and then you get to the uh, Philippines. Then if you're successful, you go on the ship, and then you go back home to Japan. Okay? So this is just to show you that kind of propaganda is very uh, wide, and I think if you have read other resources, they even had those like flashcard stories, you know, uh, that will produce. Okay, now we go to the British Commonwealth. Uh, we don't have a lot of materials in this era, but maybe representative to show a type. A type. So one is the silk invasion maps. Uh, here you see this one is of uh, Indonesia. So these are actually made of silk. Actually, the silk maps is an uh, innovation of uh, of World War II. The British came out with the idea that we should create maps which are waterproof. They should be easy to conceal, so you can actually put it inside an inner pocket or something. It's lightweight. It's crease resistant. When I open out the map, it won't have all the folds. Okay, and, and when I'm in enemy territory, when I open the map, it doesn't make a, no a lot of noise. So it's very good. When you're in enemy territory, it tells you how to escape. So these are still evasion maps. And then other uh, countries picked up on the idea like the Americans, and they also did their own cloth maps. And then in our collection, we don't have many, but we'd like to highlight this because it's quite interesting. These are original POW art. Uh, we have actually eight paintings or sketches by Leo Rawlings. Okay, Leo Rawlings was actually a gunner and signal with the art, uh, Royal Artillery, which was mobilized in the Malayan campaign. So he was actually a prisoner of war. And during this time, he produced many drawings of this period. And he was actually interned in Changni camp. Then he went off to work in the Death Railway in the Siam Burma border. Then 1944, he was sent back again, but this time to Siam Road camp. Then later on, he went to Changni. So during this time, he produced a lot of drawings. And here we see one. It's actually a very big oil painting. Calls it a uh, sea of fire. Um, maybe I'll just uh, read a little bit. Because he did publish a book of his drawings. So he had 100, over 100 of these. He said, Singapore itself was by now a mass of burning houses, buildings, and warehouses. A waterway that runs through the middle of the city was flanked by numerous supply dumps containing oil and petroleum. Shell fire has been heavy in the area and consequently set some of these on fire. The burning oil flowed down the banks into the water and fanned by an evening breeze. It drifted through the city, a lake of fire burning oil in its path. That's why he called it Sea of Fire, because of the petroleum and the burning uh, set. It's like a sea of fire. As it travels down, it burns up everything. And these are the other paintings, are just uh, sketches actually. This is of Sime Road Camp. It's a roll call. And this is of his uh, quarters in Sime Road Camp. So he was almost like the resident artist, you know, in Sime Road Camp. He said that even the Japanese asked him to do drawings for him, for them. But that was the period where he came back from the death railway. So um, at that time, uh, situations were still okay. I mean, the POWs were not as ill-treated at that time. So he could still, he said, had moments of recreation and quiet where he would do this, but he would hide his drawings, of course. But later on, of course, things changed in the latter half of the captivity uh, when the Japanese started to lose the war. And then here we have a set. We, we have in our collection a set of drawings by uh, Saul. And these are more like ephemeral in nature. And here we see a program. Program. 
So that's how uh, the POWs tried to lift up their spirits. They created uh, theatre and then they did pantomime theatre and then uh, Sir was one of those in charge of producing the sets and the drawings and the costumes and stuff like that. So that was how uh, the POWs sort of like uh, try to get away from the monotony of uh, being in prison. And then, of course, his drawings are now collected in this book, which you will see at our library. And then I just mentioned other pictorial works. Like uh, These are not originals, but they collect these drawings. So Gerber Jortings is maybe a bit more unusual because it actually shows uh, women civilians who were interned in Sam Road Camp and then Changni. And then maybe V. Muro Griffin, uh, he was actually an official war artist. He accompanied the Australian troops in the Battle of Singapore. So of course, uh, Singapore fell. So he was captured and he was, uh, uh, yeah, he would became a prisoner of war as well. So you see in the Australian War Memorial, a lot of his uh, drawings. And here is the second book, which I didn't mention, is In Defense of Singapore. I just want to give you a feel of what these books look like. So this is a page where he shows the Caldecott working camp in Singapore. And here, the working party. They are trying to build the Shonan Jinja here. And then the POWs are cutting down wood. And here is where they were interned. And here, they are trying to pave a road. And this is their grave, and this is the Japanese graves. So this is the Caldecott working camp. So this book is like roughly divided into two, two halves. The first half is all about Singapore. And then the second half, we know that a lot of high-level officials were actually sent out from Singapore to camps outside Singapore. So this records them being sent out to Korea, which was one of the POW camps. So of course, Taiwan was the other POW camps which some of these higher-level officials were sent to. So that comes to my next. Oops. Okay, never mind. I think... <laughs> so there are some, there are too many memoirs and diaries and official history for us to list. So maybe I just list two, which is of course Percival, who led in the battle, and then Gordon Bennett, the one I mentioned. He's controversial because when after the British decided to surrender, he actually escaped from Singapore and went back to Australia through Indonesia. So he basically left his men, who were captured as POWs. So what he did was very controversial. And you can see he, right after that, he went to publish a book, 1944, while his men are still in captivity. Yeah, so he, he basically mentioned about what the battle was like and why it was imp important for him to uh, actually come out of Singapore so he can actually share intelligence of what happened here. And there are some official histories that you can refer to. This one is the British one, the war against Japan, and then a week more for Australia. And of course, uh, the Malay Regiment also has its own uh, official history. Okay, then I'd like to bring on to the idea of diaries. Uh, we have a handwritten diary by uh, Hugo. He's a prisoner of war, so it comes in two books. Uh, first and second. The first book actually deals with his time in Singapore. So it, it's almost like a log book where he lists each day uh, the battles which took place, and he analyzes it. And then after that, uh, when Singapore fell, he was first put into Changni, then he was sent off to Taiwan. So the second book uh, shows more of the POW experience when he was kept in Taiwan. So you can see he kept a record of his weight. It dropped to as low as 46.5 kg. Yes. And then he will list down like, oh, today I did what, uh, what we did. There was an air raid in Taiwan. Like, uh, today we had light punishment, meaning we didn't get punished so much and stuff like that. Uh, but I think it's Quite uh, when I was reading diary, I was I felt he restrained quite a bit because within these diaries were actually two letters. It's strange for a diary to have a letter, so I think he was like almost imagining one letter was to his wife. Uh, it it resonated with me because I share the same name with the wife, Gracie. So I mean, dear Gracie, oh okay. <laughs> so he hopes to go back and talk about his his children. And the second letter to me was a bit more poignant. It said, to whom it may concern. To me, that is like your last note. Why would you write a letter to whom it may concern? That means you write it there. Hope when you think you, you pass away, then maybe someone will find it. Uh, so he talked in his letter, he basically said, I started off like, with a lot of enthusiasm about this whole battle. But as time went on, I realized that you know, these are all like 
kind of like meaningless. <laughs> yeah, so that's from our collection. And here we have this, uh, this is after war, this is an operational diary uh, by Sir Miles Dempsey, who was the general commander, sorry, commander-in-chief of the Allied Land Forces. So he basically recorded his personal observations on post-war Malaya, Singapore, Penang. Yeah, so it's a different sort of diaries, a type script. Okay. So now um, official reports, uh, there are some, the first by Persevere, op uh, Operations on Malaya. Because I think these are still very useful for research and of course the British military administration, after they reoccupied Singapore, it wasn't straight to civilian government. They had an interim military government. So this is actually their report and about the scope of works and their progress. But when I was reading it, obviously there wasn't much they could... I mean, there's only how much they could do with the limited resources. Yeah, And then, of course, this is an official study on the diseases uh, uh, suffered by POWs in the Japanese prison camps. And this... It's supposed to be Japanese prison camps, but uh, focuses a lot on Singapore and Malaya. And then we call reports and accounts of the War Damage Commission. Okay, because uh, after the war, uh, they set up a fund, a commission to, uh, to so-called uh, uh, make, uh, make good, I guess, uh, things which were destroyed during the war. Yeah, so these are the reports. And then the last one is the report on the combined Chief of Staff and Supreme Allied Commander uh, Mountbatten. So maybe the last one, I, I just talk a bit more because it relates to the next slide. That um, this is better known as the East Southeast Asia Command. So this was formed in 1943, where they basically the Allied forces in this area regrouped, regrouped to assume operational control. So they had something called the SEAC. So this uh, report compiles everything, their strategies, and what they wanted to do. But of course, with a battle in Europe, resources are very thin. Um, basically, what I understand from reading is that their main point was just to hold the defense line. Don't let more territories be taken. And they did attempt to try to like plan to take back uh, Burma and also Singapore. So this leads to the second slide, which is the Singapore one. So this is in, in our collection. It's actually a set of top secret instructions issued by the Southeast Asia Command for the Recapture of Malay and Singapore. So this is actually called Operation Zipper. So we have these papers in our collection. And uh, if you're not sharing with me that someone looked at them and said that uh, it's quite amazing. This map, it shows like the level of detail and planning that they had already uh, started to consider about recapturing Singapore. I mean, this was all before the atomic bombing. So they had plans to try to take back these territories. Okay, now <laughs> to local sources. Okay. I'll speak through, okay. Okay, first is propaganda magazines. They are published in different languages. So we have the Shonan, Zhou uh, Nan Ri Bao, and then the Shonan Gaho, and then Fajar Asia. So this is this. Okay, so you can see this one be Zhou uh, Nan, so, uh, no, sorry, Nang Guangzhou Khan. We have quite a complete set for issue 1 to 117, which is full for 1942-45. And you can see the kind of comics here. You have Roosevelt here and then Churchill. I think this is Persevere here. And then they show how they are losing every place. So it's very propaganda. And this is, of course, propaganda magazine, but aimed at the Malay community called Fajar Asia. So this, again, we have a near complete set, uh, 19 issues. Okay. And this is just to show you the inside and the kind of articles they will have is like things like uh, how they try to compare like the spirit of Bushido with Islam, that kind of thing, you know, try to win, win people over. And then uh, in our books collection are these, I think they're quite self-explanatory. Sorry, because uh, I'm running short of time, so I'll go very fast. And here we have this uh, edible wild animal. So I think this shows food shortage. I don't know how serious they are about this. Because the kind of edible food they had like, was like and pangolin, uh, tiger. Um, and then they tell you how to set traps. And then if the meat is too tough, you can use papaya to tenderize it. Yeah, so this was actually issued by the, sh uh, the Shona equivalent of the Botanic Gardens. Okay, I just want to talk about these two books because this second one is a new one that came into our collection. So uh, besides wartime, these are pre-wartime still called wartime, but the British were preparing for war. So they did issue some books. 
regarding how to make news, you know. But I don't think when I looked at the books, I don't sense that they knew that the Japanese was going to invade. I mean, it, it didn't come through. What it came through was that these expatriate ladies were relying a lot on European products to make their food in Singapore. And we have a European outbreak of World War II in Europe, then your supply gets cut off. So it's trying to tell these expatriate ladies how to use local ingredients to make food. Yeah, and how to use leftover food. And she was very optimistic because this one even had meat and then she didn't have tapioca. So, I don't know. Okay, so now we have newspapers. I'll go very fast. These are the ones in our collection. Okay, Shonan Times is, or Shonan Shimbun now is available on Newspaper SG. So you can search, you can browse it online, all free from home. Okay, so I think this would be very useful for you. I thought I brought this out because of, in terms of artwork, you can see how the mass hit and even the change. So the word S-H-A-N-A-N Shonan, spelled that way, only appears on the first issue. After that, it was always spelled this way. Then changed to Shimbun. And these changes typically happen on the anniversary, 8 December, which is the start, la, start of the Pacific War, which is the attack on Pearl Harbor, and then the multiple successive, successive attack. They attack Malaya, they bomb Singapore. So 8 December is a very important date for them. And I just want to highlight these two newspapers again, because these are recent discoveries. I was looking for something else, and when I opened the box, I saw these two. One issue, one issue, but very excited. <laughs> one is Yamoto Times, and one is Rising Sun. These are actually English, but these were published in Malaya. I don't know if any library has this. Though it's one issue, is quite interesting, because Yamoto Times was actually published by, I think, a uh, Eurasian. No, um... Not Eurasian, sorry. Uh, was published by a Malaysian writer and journalist of the Malaya Tribune, yeah, of South Indian origin. And then here you have, because I'm trying to show how they use propaganda for, you know, CNT model, no? They also use racial profiling, right? Malay was about one, Chinese was about one. So every community, we will have one propaganda for you. So this one is uh, Indian, Indian publisher called Rising Sun. Okay, now on to textbooks. Okay, textbooks, we have three types. Okay, those produced for schools in Singapore, public schools, to be used in public schools. And then this one is aimed for adults. So this is produced by the Malay Military Administration. And then the third type of textbooks are for private schools, uh, the Shona Hoganji Japanese School, which I'll go on into detail. So this one is the one that is used by uh, common schools. Uh, so you can see this Putong Gong Xue Xiao Yong here. And then this tells you it's produced by the Japanese. And you can see here and here, it's the same title, but the script looks different because this one is in Katakana and this one is Hiragana. So this actually conforms to the Japanese. Uh, they had some kind of guideline how textbooks should be written. So it must appear first, Katakana, then Hiragana, and then Kanji. Basically, Japanese had three writing scripts, so they thought katakana was the easiest, and then you move on to kanji, which almost looks like Jap Chinese, and is the most difficult. But, I mean, talking to colleagues who learn Japanese, they say now there's nobody learn Japanese this way. Hiragana is very important, because most of your words use hiragana and kanji. The katakana words you hardly use. Katakana is usually used for foreign words. So, well, that's how they produce. And then here you can see they try to impart some kind of like value. These are the Malay boys with the flag, rising flag. I wanted to bring up that these stories inside, besides like this is a table, this is a chair. They also had stories like Mama Taro. So why I bring up Mama Taro? Because you see this uh, memoir by uh, Enilo. He talked about this Mama Taro fairy tale, which is Mama Taro, to cut a long story short, it's about this boy who comes from heaven and he comes in a peach to these aging parents. And you know, he met some animals and then they wage war against the devil. So Mama Toro was a very famous folklore that was used in a lot of propaganda. So basically Japan is Mama Taro, okay, then the citizens are the animals and they fight against the big bad people which were Americans, okay, or the British. So they had all these stories inserted inside the textbook and this one is for adults. So you can see Chen Ren Yong, uh. of course they have to pronounce it in Japanese. These are actually all Japanese, it's just that it's in kanji. And I think this one is probably used in Malacca because we have this stamp here that says Malacca. Okay, then these were the certs because I don't have the textbook. Uh, no, sorry. These are the certs for the Nippongo Institute. So they're a very important school just at Queen Street. 
okay, first run by military, then later run by the municipal council. And here, I don't have this because it's on loan to the former fa Ford factory. Nihongo Kukuise Kung, sorry, basically it's a textbook uh, written by Okamoto Yoshio, who was the priest for the Shonan Hoganji at Oxley, number three Oxley Rise. So uh, he would actually put all these uh, war dead, Japanese war dead soldiers, their ashes are actually in that shrine. And he would uh, be in charge of like taking care of all the press and stuff like that. But he also ran a school, a private school where he teach beginner Japanese, like three months. So this is like the student pass. This is the result slip. Okay, then we have a lot of learning books here for polyglot society, right? So I have one for every language. The last one, lucky good, you got English, Malay, Hindustani, Hokkien, Nuponis, huh? All language. Okay, I think this is a bit unusual because this one is Japanese learning Malay, not. Usually you see the books is uh, Chinese, English, Chinese or Tamil, learning Japanese But you'll find somehow in our collection a lot of the Malay books were the Japanese trying to learn Malay Okay, then these are the Japanese textbooks And you, I think this picture is very famous You see in a lot of posters, propaganda posters Okay, I flip And then just go quickly, this one Again, illustrated, you see the children and the soldier This is by a very famous cartoonist uh, and then just to go further in, and you can see this woman. We love war games. Uh. Uh, Indian children and Malay children. Make war against America and Britain. But, 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 Nobody want to play American and British people. So it's very difficult. Okay, propaganda. Okay, then we have a lot of dictionary. Okay, fast track, fast track. Okay, now, documents and ephemera. <laughs> I'll mention three donors. I mentioned their names because they are all catalogued at collection level. So it's easier to look for them. So these are the materials that are in these collections. Basically, reports, lease agreement certificate. Uh, by the custodian or enemy property receipts, ration cards, school cert, the identity. So here I show from the Kosia Chang collection, this is the report of the Kansai car, which is uh, some sort of doing all the enemy or custodian. So this is like a lease agreement. You agree to give me this land for me to put my, for Shonan Tokubutsu purposes, which is a Shonan municipal purpose, I'll pay you this amount, $100 a month. Okay, and then here you have the bank passbook. You say, why passbook? No money, <laughs> nobody has money, why they have a bank passbook? Because basically they had a program, right? They had inflation, right? Everything was so expensive, got black market. So one way to tackle inflation is to get people to deposit money into the bank. So the Japanese government had this bank idea, la. they call it savings program. So this is a program and this is the census cards. They also took census at that time. And census card, census is important because it's actually tied to the ration card. So if you look at the ration cards, they actually have the census number on top. So you have to be registered before you can take your rations. And now, of course, personal narratives a lot. I mentioned Malay upside down because it's one of the first and the earliest. Okay? And maybe I'd just like to uh, bring this one up also. History of Formation. This is actually written by Tan Yeok Xiong, who was the secretary of the Overseas Chinese Association. So we all knew that the Japanese had this uh, program where they extorted $50 million from the Chinese. So they were made up. So the Overseas Chinese Association was actually set up for that. Uh, uh, Led by, yeah, so it's made out of uh, China born Chinese and the uh, straight Chinese. Huh? Okay, and then I just want to talk about fictional treatment. So, um, came, uh, maybe I haven't really looked quite deep into it, but I find, I was trying to find like uh, Malay memories of occupation, and I find that most of them tend to come out in fictional treatment. So they were, they were telling the preface that this is inspired by a real life story, but the story itself is not a uh, so called inverted commas, factual account, they're actually fiction works. So you see these, Harun, uh, okay, sorry, I forgot his name. Uh, so these are the books published on that. And then of course we have pictorial works. I think most people will be familiar with Liu Kang's uh, Chop Sui. Uh, three volumes in English and then one volume in Chinese. The library only has three in English. And then this is Ma Chun Ying's Tongku, uh, Hui Yi and Hei An Zi Nian which I have here, uh, reprint, so you all can look through. This is a picture, okay, Sok Ching. And then here, uh, 
I already put the less sensitive picture. <laughs> if you flip through the book, it's quite, uh, horrid, uh, quite frightening. So this is a war crime tribunal. Most of the materials in this collection were donated by Mr. Lee. Ki Lee. Uh, here you have a photograph. Uh, we have a set of two photographs on the war crime tribunal. So there were actually 100 over trials held in Singapore after the Japanese surrender. Not all about Singapore, some were for the areas, uh, regions surrounding it. So he also has those in the Far East. And I'd just like to uh, end off with the last one, which is the double tent trial. Um, because I, as a librarian, I was very captured by this cover art. Because I never really knew much about the double tent. I mean, I knew what it was about, but I didn't know it had an association with the Chinese Republican Day. That's why it was called double tent. So you see this here on the cover art. This si and si is two ten, double ten. Uh, so it's used as a cover art. So we basically, um, people were captured uh, in and around the 20th, uh, 10, sorry, 10 of October. Uh, okay, sorry, for, for, I forgot the dates. Sorry, uh, they were captured because uh, some ships, uh, vessels were sunk at the Singapore harbour. So the Japanese actually thought that uh, they were using transmitters in the Changi POW camp to transmit uh, these messages, and, and and the POWs were actually responsible for the for these uh, vessels, Japanese vessels being sunk at the Singapore harbour. But actually, these people were innocent, so they brought them into the Kempetai branches, YMCA being the main one. So this is actually a transcript of the court proceedings, and it basically details all the atrocities and that were done. Yeah. So even so, this has a very Chinese like Chinese Republican Day, right? Double double ten, but actually. You look at the prosecution statement, the opening statement, when they describe the atrocities, uh, the worst ones actually happened to the Eurasians. Okay, and lastly, I just want to end with this. Uh, uh, most of the materials, I'm sorry, we are not able to show it today. We usually have a tradition of showing them because they are actually in our gallery and some of them are really fragile. So we will be opening up the rare gallery for some public tours. So you can go look at Go Library. And I just want to thank all these colleagues because I don't read Japanese. Neither do I read Malay and all. I read a bit of Chinese. So without their help, uh, none of this would have been possible. And also, these are the ways to contact us. Okay, hi. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks for letting me get crushed this librarian's world. I'll try to make it very fast. <laughs> so um, what I'll be doing is just giving a short introduction, but bear in mind that this is definitely not an exhaustive uh, introduction to some of the items that we have in the National Archives of Singapore that has to do with World War II. Um, so this is, generally speaking, a brief outline of the kinds of collections that I'll be talking about. Uh, overseas acquisitions that we have, some of the British military administration files, um, our oral history collection, as well as some of the personal and private collections that we have. Um, so in terms of overseas acquisitions, um, now we do know that a lot of items um, that, that relate to World War II uh, can be found mainly in, in overseas uh, collections such as uh, the National Archives of UK, Imperial War Museums, as well as the Australian War Memorial. Um, I'll just bring in some examples here, but of course I know a lot of you here will have, will have probably used more of these uh, resources more than I, I have come across. Uh, so, for instance, I mean, from the Imperial War Museums, we have things like uh, Cyril Wild, Major Cyril Wild. He was the uh, translator in the Surrender Party uh, that, that went up to the, the former Fort, uh, the Fort Factory building to, to sign the surrender document. So, he in the Imperial War Museums, there are some of his papers, including uh, his his own uh, account of what happened, uh, a blow by blow account of what happened uh, during that, that that fateful day on 15 February. Um, from Australian War Memorial, we have things like. Uh, 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 Lieutenant General uh, Arthur Percival's note on the instrument of surrender. This comes as close as we get to, to the document of surrender that was